I bet you guys thought I was going to come out with walk-up music like the uh, 2001 The Space Odyssey, you know, that music that plays like that. And, and I decided to do something a little bit different and uh, to do something that was more kind of akin to, to who I am, and I'll come back to that in a minute. I would be remiss if I did not thank Nina and her staff for um, bringing me here to speak to you today about something that's dear to my heart, and that is dreaming and education. The, uh, when I look at education, I look at education as a way in which we can empower those dreams. So I think the topic that you have for your conference is, is certainly appropriate. So what am I going to talk about? Of course, I'm an astronaut. I've got to talk a little bit about space. But more importantly, I want to talk about why I think it's, it's important for you to be meeting today and changing how we educate our kids, the innovative uh, charter uh, programs that you have across the country. But let me go back to why I chose Happy. I chose Happy because of this. When I was um, young growing up, I was telling the folks backstage that I actually grew up uh, born in Texas, but actually grew up on the Navajo Indian Reservation because my mom was an educator and she worked for the Bureau of Indian Affairs out there. And it was uh, out there that I would look up at the heavens and see this view of space. And as I looked at those lights, I would wonder, that, were some of those lights, um, you know, planets? Were some of those other stars? Were some of those other galaxies? And I actually love this particular photo because, believe it or not, if you ever find yourself in an area where you have no light pollution and you're able to look out and look up in the heavens and just, if you could, look up and just draw like a square inch and imagine in that square inch is this photo that I'm showing you right now. And in that represents millions of stars, hundreds of galaxies, and just imagine if you, you, you know, turn around and look 360 degrees and realize that in every point of space there is this type of stars and lights and planets that fulfill it. So I'm happy about that. This happiness led me to fall in love with the space program. In 1969 we landed on the moon and uh, when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed on the moon in those fabulous words, one st small step one giant step for mankind. It was a giant leap for this little boy to look up the heavens and want to follow in their footsteps. That was 1969. So what's happening now? We have a space station that's up where we have astronauts, about six or seven of them there, 24-7, 365 days a year. Uh, there are plans uh, just recently announced to go back to the moon and then perhaps even go to Mars. What's next? What next is we have companies, not just governments, that are interested in um, building the next generation space shuttle. Uh, and so we have people like Elon Musk with SpaceX and uh, Jeff Bezos with Blue Horizon and the Boeing Corporation, all are looking for better ways in which to get us into to low Earth uh, orbit. Uh, to get us to the space station and beyond. But as an astronaut, I'm not only worried about what's up in space, I'm also worried about what we're doing here on Earth. And what's happening here on Earth? Well, over the last 10 years or so, we've had companies like Google and Microsoft and LinkedIn and, of course, that famous Twitter that our president is making very famous these days. We've had the advent of the iPhone and the iPad that has brought about just new imaginings, new apps, which allows us to not only do financial things, but uh, to do medical things. In fact, you know I'm a medical doctor and involved in telemedicine. We do that on these devices. And then I asked myself, then, what's next? Well, you probably heard about Bitcoin. And Bitcoin has started things, uh, us talking about things like blockchain, and, and then there's AI and artificial intelligence, natural language processing, uh, disruptive technologies of all the light. And with all of that, 
sort of setting the stage for this afternoon's talk, I ask you this question. Are we and are our students and our youth, our children, prepared for that future, in essence, that now? So as I poll that question, I want you to think about it during the rest of my presentation, because I'm going to ask you that question again, and we're going to do a poll to see how this audience fares on this question. But now I want to turn my attention to some other questions. And those are questions that I get as an astronaut. Dr. Harris, you've been in space. What was it like to travel in space? You've been an astronaut. Uh, have you seen any aliens in space? And I have to say no, but some of the astronauts that I fly with are kind of strange. <laughs> and then probably the, the question I get asked most, whether it's a five-year-old or a 65-year-old, is how do you go to the bathroom in space? I don't know what it is about that question, but everybody wants to know about those bodily functions. And so I'm not going to talk about that at all. But I, I do want to spend <laughs> a few minutes talking with you and, and sharing with you my experience of blasting in space. In fact, that's probably the real reason why you invited me to come this evening is to, to give you the experience of what it's like to travel in space. Again, in this slide, you see the original seven. Those were the astronauts that were initially uh, selected by by the space program, and you notice something about this slide that's a little different than this slide here, which is a slide of my class. Well, the big deal, of course, it's in color. And what I mean by that, there are Latinos. <laughs> you can applaud that. There are Latinos, Hispanics, African Americans, Asians, women in this class, more importantly. And so in 1990, I applied to the astronaut corps and was accepted. There were 23 of us, and this is a picture of us. We spent about um, two years doing basic training, and then we get prepared to go into space. And I want to share with you that, that experience. Uh, before we actually get in the vehicle and we start our training, we get together and we uh, we create a patch, which is an insignia of the mission. And uh, you'll see that here on the right side of the slide. And you'll notice that there is a, a American and Russian flag because we were the first shuttle to go to the Russian space station. You'll notice that there is a depiction of the Russian station and then the space shuttle for that. And in this the slide is the symbol for the mission number. And here's your first or your second question for today. And that is, the mission number is 63, and I would like you to take a look at this um, patch and see if you can find the symbol for the six and three. And when you see it, or uh, yell it out, if you would. Three stars. That's right, and six rays of the sun. Well, you know, that's all well and good, but you know the most important thing about this patch is, is that it has my name on it right there. So let's go to space. We're going to do a quick little countdown here. And I told I got to turn it up so you can really get the feel for what it's like to blast off. Five, four, three, two, one. You feel that force? Liftoff. We have liftoff. Houston now controlling. Houston shuttle roll program. Roger, roll maneuver. Already seven miles away from the Kennedy Space Center at an altitude of five miles. So people always want to know what it's like to be inside of that. Well, I have to tell you that when those engines light, you're leaving this planet, and nothing's going to hold you to it. It's an incredible ride. As you get pushed back in your seat, about three times your, your weight, so three Gs. And uh, within one or two minutes, we reach an altitude of 100,000 feet. And that's this point that they just showed on the slide where we drop off the solid rocket motors. We actually recover those, and then we go on into space. Uh, another six and a half minutes, we get safely locked in orbit. And then we drop off the external tank. You'll see the shuttle you know, kind of winding off of that tank as the tank falls back into the atmosphere and burns up on, on the way in. 
So if you were doing your math, that was a total of eight and a half minutes. In that eight and a half minutes, we go from being pushed back in a seat to three and a half times our weight. So I weigh around 225 pounds and in increasing. <laughs> so you multiply that times three and a half and you get to, you know, about a thousand pounds is what the force feels like under the, under the liftoff. So we go from that force to zero gravity in a split second and everything floats. It was just incredible to have that first experience up there. And then, I love this slide. This was the first photo that I took on my first mission out the uh, cargo bay window. And you can see that we fly upside down to the Earth, and you can see the sun in the background, but more importantly, you'll see that the Earth is indeed round for you Flat Earth Society members <laughs> who are left out there. So let me share with you our crew. So on the left side of the slide here is the crew on the ground. And you'll notice that we have two suits, our launch and entry suits. The suits we go into space and come from space, they weigh 125 pounds. Those are the orange ones. And the suits at the top are our EVA suits. Those are used to do our spacewalk, and they weigh 350 pounds. Take a look at our faces, if you would. And then flip over to the right, and you'll see that you'll notice that our eyes get a little puffy and that uh, get a little narrow. Uh, you'll notice uh, a person, and let me identify Eileen Collins, who is the first female pilot and commander of Space Shuttle Mission. She is a young lady right below me. Look at her hair before and look at her hair after. <laughs> she developed an instant afro. Now, I'm running out of time, but I think with this audience, I, I definitely have to share this story. Would you, would you mind, can I share one little story with you? So it has to do with is the other female astronaut that's in this photo, and her name is Janice Voss. And Janice is a physicist, very smart young lady. And I was in the mid-deck. We have two decks. We have a flight deck where we control the vehicle, and then we have the mid-deck where it's kind of a living spaces and their experimental spaces. And one day I was working on an experiment, and she comes floating in right next to me, and she reaches into her locker, which is her clothing locker, and she pulls out a shirt, and she hangs the shirt in the air. Remember, we're in space, so you can just hang there. And then she commenced to pulling the sh shirt out of the pants in which she was wearing, and she started putting her hand up here and toward the front part of her chest, and, okay, guys in the audience, what guy will ignore a woman if she's got her hands up the front part of her chest. So I turned to her and I said, what are you doing? And she says very kindly in sort of, you know, stoically, I don't know what the right words are, but imagine this. As her hand came from underneath her shirt, she had her bra in her hand and she released it for effect. And you can imagine these words as the bra was going end over end, I do not need that up here. And I realized in that moment, with all of these darn degrees that I have, that I didn't know what a bra was. It's an anti-gravity device. <laughs> and so are the chairs in which you're sitting in, so are the pillows, so are the mattresses, and, and, and like, okay, that's the last, that's the only story I'm gonna tell, okay. Let me stay on topic here. So the puffiness in the face, let me just explain that comes from a fluid shift as you're sitting here about one-fifth of your blood volumes in your lower extremity held down there by gravity. When you go into space, that floats up toward your head. That extra fluid gets in the tissues of the face, and it causes your face to swell. It causes a swelling in the brain. That is now causing some issues with our international crew, with them developing blind spots in space, about 30% of the crew, because of that increase in cranial pressure. Uh, we also lose 1% of bone per month, 15% of our muscle mass, and all of those medical physiological changes occur because we have taken the big G out of the equation of physiology and everything that we do up there. And you know all that physiology stuff, you know what I call that? As a medical doctor, job security. <laughs> so here's me examining one of our crew members. Here is me, uh, actually a photo uh, that I took when we went to the Mir Space Station. And you'll see the guy who spent the most time in space ever, 422 days, who happens to be another physician, Dr. Polinikov. And you'll see a view from about a mile and a half from the International Space Station. 
As you heard in my introduction that I did a spacewalk, this is us in the airlock, and then a couple of photos with us hanging out in space, which is kind of cool. I have another one that I show because they said I only had 20 minutes, so I didn't get to show all of that. But it was beautiful. If I had showed it, you would be going, whoa. <laughs> How about this one? It's kind of cool. So this is Aurora Borealis from space. And just a couple of other photos. I wanted to show you daytime and nighttime at the same time. And that is the, the slide that's there to your right, lower right. You'll see again Aurora Borealis, and you'll see a dust storm in the upper left, which is uh, coming off the Sahara Desert. And that dust storm is up to 50,000 feet. That dust will go completely over the Atlantic Ocean and dump here in the Americas. And then one of the most beautiful views of the Mir Space Station as we are um, getting for our close approach. Now, I mentioned, let's see if we can get this to work. If I press the right button, we can. So it was, it was mentioned earlier that I had traveled 400 and something miles and uh, traveled 7.2 million miles. How do I do that? It's because we go awfully fast, 17,500 miles an hour. And at 17,500 miles an hour, we can go around the world every 90 minutes. We get to see a sunset or sunrise every 45 minutes. And what I'd like to show you right now is a sunrise from space. And at the end of this, I want everybody to say, wow. And in the time that it took those slides to cycle through and for me to take that sip of water, that is how fast the sun rises. And the temperature will go from, wait a minute, hang on. <laughs> the temperature will go from a minus 165 degrees to 200 degrees Fahrenheit in that period of time. Now you can go, wow. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Now. Let's talk some serious stuff if I can. Let's go back to this question here as a poll. How many of you think that we in our youth are prepared for this future, for this now? Let me see a show of hands if I can. All right, okay, just a few. How many think that we are not prepared? Raise your hand. Okay, well that's why I'm here. That's why I run the National Math and Science Initiative. That's why I think that you guys, all of you, are running these innovative charters all over, the, all over the country. We have to prepare our kids now for jobs that don't exist today. If you think about it, 15 years ago, there was no such thing as Facebook or Twitter or you know, any, of these, any of these things that, that our kids are involved in. We didn't have the iPhone and the iPads, and just think about that. So. Uh, so we have to prepare them, and that means that they have to have this, this baseline of education in which STEM is at the heart of it. And so that's what we do in the Math and Science Initiative. When I look at those things that are important for us to teach our kids, I guess this statement is something that, uh, that I believe is true, that no matter what job that they're going to be involved in, it's going to involve STEM because we are in a technology-driven society, a technology-driven world that is not going to change, it's just going to get even worse. And if our kids are not prepared, then they won't get the good jobs. And I know I'm speaking to the, the choir here, um, but you know that STEM jobs are high-paying jobs. And so if we want to do all our communities justice, we've got to make sure that embodied in the education that you are providing, that it involves STEM. So how do we do that? We do that by producing uh, scalable solutions for both CMOs and individual charters. We do that by creating innovative ways in which to take the technology and lessons and education to where the kids are utilizing technology, not only teaching technology, but utilizing technology. We must be advocates for STEM. We must provide teacher training and support and school support and the resources that are necessary for that and develop a way in which to uh, distribute best practices out there so that we can enhance learning across all of the campuses in which 
you serve. So it is a challenge. It's a STEM challenge. And NIMSI actually started 10 years ago with a challenge from the National Academy of Sciences where uh, they did a study and it was chaired by the, the chairman of the uh, ExxonMobil Foundation and the chairman of Intel and they brought together experts from all over and they came to the conclusion that the United States was not ready, that we were not prepared. And that if we weren't prepared, then there would be a uh, gathering storm that would hit this country in which we have to resolve. And so that preparation involves STEM, math and science. That preparation involved preparing our kids for te technology innovations, technological innovations, of a way in which to upgrade how we teach, how we educate, and how we educate our teachers to teach more STEM. And so NIMC was started. Our mission is very plain. We are here to serve all students, especially those further from opportunities. And those are the students that I know that you are, that you are a part of addressing. And so we have three primary programs in which we use. And if you haven't figured it out, this is my commercial. And the first is our college readiness program, which is our way in which to scale the AP, so provide AP um, training into schools. Uh, we also have a program called Laying the Foundation, which provides K through 12 um, professional development for your teachers, so keep us in mind. And then lastly, we are also involved in the teacher pipeline. And since we're in Austin, Texas, uh, our leading program is called You Teach, which developed was developed right here at the University of Texas and now is in 44 universities across the nation. So in that 10 years, we have uh, done a lot. Um, we have uh, served over 1,200 schools. We've educated over 1.5 million students, 44 universities I talked about, and we also have done a lot in terms of teacher prep preparation. And, and just a sort of case and study of one of the programs, the AP, I'm sure that this audience know that uh, kids who take AP courses uh, do better. They are, they're better prepared for college and uh, they're better prepared to go into those fields that we're, we're talking about. And in the schools in which we have served, we've seen remarkable gains in the Latino and the Hispanic, uh, Latino, Hispanic and African American population. And I just wanted a couple of slides here to end just to sort of show you this is the improvement in AP scores after just one year, and this is across all of our school types. And then we also work with a number of charters over the last few years, and this is uh, data from 30 of our charter schools where, again, you see the significant improvement in those a AP scores. So that's what we're about. Um, the students recognize our, what, what we're able to do. The teachers recognize what we're able to do, and certainly, we hope that uh, during the course of this conference and after my keynote and, and knowing what we do as an organization that you also will recognize what, what we're doing. I'll end with this slide. Ain't I cute? <laughs> Wasn't I cute? I don't know what happened and all that sort of thing. But I put this slide in here to remind us that our responsibility is, is not only to make sure that we deliver a high quality education, and in our case, a high quality STEM education, but that we enable our kids to dream. Because that's where it started for me as a, as a kid looking at the space program, which set me on the road on the educational gauntlet that allowed me to go into space, become a medical doctor, and be here today to address you. It's about making sure that they feel empowered. Now this is a poster that, that I take around uh, with me, especially when I talk to, to kids and try to inspire them. And it says, for those who can't see it in the back, that I am an infinite being with infinite possibilities. And what that means is that these kids, well, you know, before I do that, I know I've run out of time, I got zero on my clock. Can you give me one more minute? I wanna do something with you if I can. What I do with the kids is I have them repeat this, and I, I, and I love this audience, so I'm a, I know you guys are gonna do real well. So what I do is I have the kids stand up, and I'm not gonna have you stand up, you can just sit there, and I tell them to repeat after me, so I'm gonna ask you to do that if you would. Would you repeat after me? I'm an infinite being with infinite possibilities. 
I think it's about 2,000 of you here, and that did not move me at all. So I want you to say it and let's rock the house here. I'm an infinite being, I'm an infinite being. With, infinite with infinite possibilities. Good. So let me tell you what that means. That means that each and every one of you in this room and the students in which you serve are born multi-potential with the ability to do anything that they, they can do in life, they want to do in life. It means that they are born multi-talented with certain talents that are uniquely theirs and they can use something called a brain that allows them to learn other talents and other skills. That's what we are about in helping them learn, learn those skills and abilities. And more importantly, and this is a message that I think needs to go to all of our kids, especially the kids in which you serve, is that they were born for a reason, that there is a reason that they are here. And when you, you can applaud to that, And when you make them realize that, no matter where they come from, of that possibility, of that infiniteness, then you do more help for them. You help the rest of the world because what they're gonna to bring to the table will change the world. And what we get out of it is that we had a, we had a stake in enabling them and as in your theme, empower them to dream big. I want to thank you for your time this evening, this afternoon. Thank you very much. God bless you.